Hello, people of the internet. John Perry here. Welcome to the first ever deep dive video into one of my Stated Clearly animations. So, for those who don't know, this YouTube channel, Stated Casually, is my second YouTube channel. My first YouTube channel is Stated Clearly. And over there, I do short animations about genetics and evolution and chemistry. They're between five and ten minutes long. To create one of those animations, a stated clearly animation, what I usually end up doing is reading dozens and dozens of papers uh, on a specific topic. I meet with researchers, I talk with them, uh, I do all this work, I do, I learn all of this information, and then I condense that down into a five or ten minute animation. And as you can imagine, I cut out a lot of really cool stuff when I create those animations. And that is particularly true with this video, What is Symbiosis, that I just published on the Stated Clearly YouTube channel. And so I wanted to do a video, a deep dive into the literature. I wanted to show you some of the papers that I had found when I was doing research for this animation and go in into more depth, especially on the stuff about squirrels. This animation was inspired by these squirrels that I happen to be raising uh, right now. We have some orphaned squirrels and we're working with the city where we live to uh, rehabilitate them and release them back into the city. They're, they're urban squirrels uh, where they will live in the, quote, wild. Not really the wild. They live in people's backyards and city parks and so on. So I've had these amazing little animals in my house. And I was curious about them. I started reading about them. I started reading about the, the foods they eat and the how the trees have responded to squirrels because squirrels can actually be pretty abusive to a tree they eat bark they their nests can cause branches to die and the way that they build their nests the way that they strip bark in the winter and so on and uh i just got really excited reading about this this war between squirrels and trees and the way that they've evolved to deal with each other it was really fascinating and it inspired this whole animation so i wanted to go create this video to talk a little bit more about this battle between squirrels and trees and also to address an issue about possums in my video. Here we're going to ask, first of all, what is an evolutionary arms race? Because I, I bring that up in the animation. What is an evolutionary arms race? What adaptations have trees evolved to cope with squirrels and to actually control squirrel populations? How have squirrels evolved in response to the trees' traits? And then finally, how is it that possums eat 5,000 ticks per week during tick season? This is a claim that I make in the animation, and it sounds like a crazy claim because 5,000 ticks per week, that's over 700 ticks per day, and it seems crazy that one animal could eat 700 of another animal, no matter how large or small that other animal is, because it just takes a long time to hunt another organism, right? Let's dig in here with our first question. What is an evolutionary arms race? If you look up evolutionary arms race online, you'll find lots of articles about predators versus prey. And an evolutionary arms race works in much the same way that an arms race works between two nations. So we're all familiar with the history of the United States and nuclear weapons, I'm sure. So in World War II, America produced the nuclear bomb <laughs> in response Russia and China, a bunch of other countries started building their own nuclear bombs. You know, it was obvious that this is now a possible thing to invent, and so they got their scientists working hard to invent their own weapons to counteract ours. And different nations also dealt with different ways to, you know, if we do get bombed, are there countermeasures, are there ways to destroy bombs before they hit us, and so on. So there is this escalating arms race between nations, and a very similar thing happens between organisms. They don't hire scientists to invent new adaptations for them instead. The gradual process of descent with modification acted upon by selection produces new traits in the prey and in the predator as the two species battle each other over millions of years. The gazelle and the cheetah. The cheetah has evolved to run super fast to catch its prey and multiple prey items that are preyed on regularly by cheetahs have evolved either really fast running speeds as well, or they've evolved the ability to maneuver, outmaneuver the cheetah, so the cheetah can't catch them with its, with its fast speed. Each organism is trying to survive and reproduce within its environment, 
and for the gazelle, the cheetah is a part of its environment. For the cheetah, the gazelle is a part of its environment, a very important part of its environment, and so it's going to evolve and adapt to its prey item as the prey item evolves and adapts to the predator. Well, squirrels and oak trees are also locked into an evolutionary arms race. The squirrel is a predator on the seeds of the oak tree, and the oak tree is, you know, it's adapting and actually using the squirrel to its own advantage, as we learned in the animation. The first adaptation that trees have evolved to deal with squirrels is, of course, as mentioned in my animation, the evolution of toxins inside their seeds. And the toxins that they use are what we call tannins. It's a, it's a group of molecules that act to precipitate proteins out of solution. <laughs> so lots of plants have tannins. If you want to know what tannins are like, what you should do is you should eat a green banana. Go to the store, buy the greenest banana you can possibly find and take it home and take a bite of it. What's gonna happen is it's gonna taste bitter and your mouth will have this really weird dry sensation. It'll feel kind of like there's a, your spit is turning chunky. Your saliva is turning chunky and it actually is. What's happening is the proteins in your saliva are gumming up together and, and forming kind of this film that you can almost like scrape off the inside of your mouth with your tongue. And tannins work as toxins by making it so that the animal that eats too much tannins, they cannot digest their food properly because all of the proteins in their stomach, all of the enzymes that have evolved to help them digest their food, they all get gummed up by these tannins. They form this weird film and the food cannot be properly digested. So if you die of tannin poisoning, a lot of times what you're dying of is just malnourishment. So it's not fast acting poison. It doesn't kill you right away. It actually just kind of makes you starve. I should probably point out now that I've told you to eat tannins, eat a green banana, that eating one bite of one banana is not really gonna hurt you because the tannins only stay in your body for a few hours. In order to actually die of tannin, you have to eat tannin every day with all of your meals and then you will slowly starve to death. But <laughs> eating one bite of one banana is fine. It also does have effects if you eat really high amounts of tannin. It can affect your liver and the lining of your stomach. So it can actually act as a direct toxin and actually affect you in other ways. But the main way that tannins uh, hurt the animal that eats them is that it, it causes them to, to, to starve. They, they die of malnourishment. So obviously animals want to avoid tannins and trees have evolved to put lots of tannins in their seeds so that squirrels and birds and other animals won't want to eat them. Instead, they'll want to bury them, cache them for a while. And there is a paper, this paper right here, which is called, Can Acorn Tannin Predict Scrub Jay Caching Behavior? And what they did in the study is they, they collected a bunch of different acorns from different species of acorn producing trees, and they measured how much tannins there were in them. And they found that plants that produced nuts with high levels of tannins, those high tannin seeds were most likely to be cached by scrub jays or by squirrels. By cached, I mean the animals would bury them and save them for later. And we think that they do this for several reasons. One is that, you know, if, it's, if it doesn't have very much tannin in it, it's good to eat right now. So the animal will eat it immediately because it's, it's good food. If it does have a lot of tannin, it's not ideal. It's not horrible, but it's not ideal. So what they'll do is they will store it for later for just in case in the future they can't find any good food, then they'll go eat the kind of gross food with too much tannins in it. And then the other reason that they're caching it is because this study found that by caching them, the tannins decrease over time. And we think that what's happening is that rainwater is seeping into these seeds and pulling out the tannins. Tannins are water soluble. There are lots of people human cultures that have eaten acorns and what they do to deal with the tannins is they will soak the acorns in water and they'll change the water frequently they'll soak them for hours and then change the water and then soak them for hours again and if you do this a couple of times then the the acorns don't have tannins in them anymore and you can eat them and it looks like this is what the squirrels are doing it looks like that the second thing that nut trees have done is they've evolved these hard outer shells around their nuts and this makes it so that when an animal finds a nut, it's a lot of work to open it. And so they're only going to bother opening it and eating it right then and there if they're really hungry. It's usually easier to just save it for later for when they're really hungry. And so you get a lot of caching behavior because of that. There was a really interesting study in the Canadian Cascades 
where different populations of squirrels had evolved different jaw sizes to cope with different types of seeds in their environment. So uh, in environments that had really hard seeds, the squirrels were larger and had bigger jaw muscles and bigger jaw bones. And then in areas where they had softer shells on their seeds, the squirrels had smaller jaw muscles and the squirrel overall was actually smaller. So there's definitely an evolutionary correlation the squirrels are adapting to the tree's defenses. There's this back and forth going on here, an evolutionary arms race. Last but not least, one of the nastiest tricks that trees play on squirrels is called seed masting. What they'll do is they'll produce hardly any seeds for multiple years, usually three to five years, and then all of a sudden, all of the trees in an area will somehow coordinate their seed production and produce massive amounts of seeds all in one season. And what this does is it causes the squirrels to just go crazy. They eat all the nuts they can. They're all full, they're happy. And then they start hoarding nuts and getting themselves ready for the winter. They will bury hundreds and hundreds of seeds all over the place. And so many seeds, in fact, that they can't eat them during the winter. Their populations are small because the trees have been holding back on them for several years now. So their population has been starved down. Now there's an abundance of food, so much that they can't even eat it all. In the springtime, all of those uneaten seeds will grow into baby little trees. The trees have reproduced successfully and the squirrels have done really well that year. So well that they have a population explosion of their own. All of the mothers produce tons of milk because they had great food, great nutrition all winter long. They have lots of babies. And then winter hits again, but there's no food for the squirrels because the trees stopped producing seeds the trees will actually starve out the squirrels to keep their populations in a manageable size. Because when there's too many squirrels, they start eating a lot of bark, they start causing a lot of chaos to the trees. The trees have responded over evolutionary time to control the squirrels' population. Now this trick obviously doesn't work so well inside of cities because during the winter, squirrels will eat garbage and other things, but out in the wild, out in the forests, this works extremely well for squirrel population control. Nasty little tricks. So I think that pretty much covers the evolutionary arms race fairly well. There's some other things. If you read the papers that I've linked in the video description, you can read about more tricks that trees are playing on squirrels and vice versa. But I think it's time now to move on to the possum issue. In my animation, I claim that possums are eating 5,000 ticks per week during tick season. This is a claim that's actually been floating around the internet for a long time, and it's been floating around in meme form. And Snopes, which is a website that debunks misleading claims, misleading memes, wrote an article saying that this claim is only partially true. But the article that they wrote is actually wrong. They claim in their article that possums don't really eat 5,000 ticks per week, they eat 5,000 ticks per year. And that is not true. If you look at the actual research paper, the actual estimation that scientists really did produce, it is 5,000 per week during tick season. And to understand how an animal could ever eat 5,000 of any other animal in one week, you need to understand the behavior of ticks. During tick season, during the, their larval season, which lasts between uh, two weeks to two months, in certain parts of the country. So in New York, it's, it's about two months long. Ticks are constantly hatching in clusters of about 1,000 to 1,500 at a time. If you are a possum walking around in the woods, you're going to stumble upon these, and you're gonna stumble upon several of them a day during tick season. Quite, it's, this is quite possible. And so during that time, you're gonna be covered in ticks, and you'll be grooming yourself, licking your fur, and you'll be munching on those ticks. And that is why the scientists estimate that possums are eating over 5,000 ticks per week. And the way that they got to that number is a little bit, you might say it's a little bit questionable. Uh, they didn't actually sit there and count each tick that was eaten. They did a little bit of extrapolation. Maybe you could say that their estimation is not that solid, but the actual research does say they do estimate that possums are eating 5,000 ticks per week during larval tick season. So Snopes is actually wrong on their debunking of the meme. The meme's actually not totally correct either because it doesn't specify that this is only during 
tick season, but the meme is actually more right than the Snopes article, surprisingly. So, ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. That is my deep dive into the what is symbiosis animation. I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, feel free to support my work on Patreon if you find it interesting and helpful. And, yeah, so long for now. Stay curious.